Hello, my name's Professor Kobe Rudd. I'm the Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Strategic Partnerships here at ECU. Happy International Women's Day. Thank you for coming along to the Edith Cowan Memorial Lecture, ECU's primary contribution to celebrating International Women's Day. And I'd like to especially acknowledge the leadership of Professor Colleen Hayward AM over many years and her continuing leadership advocating for system-wide improvements in equity and diversity. So Colleen has always been key in designing these events, events including today's. I'd also like to acknowledge ECU Council Member Denise Goldsworthy and Diana Warnock, former member for Perth. And we are expecting His Worship the Mayor of the City of Joondalup, Councillor Troy Pickard. So we'll see if he's on his way. So before we begin, please take a moment to read the housekeeping notes displayed on the screen behind us here. And this morning we are joined by three highly successful political leaders and our Vice-Chancellor, who will share their experiences. <laughs> <laughs> and our highly successful <laughs> Vice-Chancellor. <laughs> who will share their experiences with you in the form of a uh, panel discussion. And this will be my last um, <laughs> event. Uh, however, before we begin, I'd like to introduce Mrs. Oriel Green to perform the Welcome to Country. Oriel is a Yamaji Nunga woman of the Yud, Balad, Dong and Amangu people. She is a community-minded individual who always puts the needs of others first before her own and regularly seizes opportunities to demonstrate her commitment to Aboriginal people and to the broader Australian community. Mrs Green was inducted into the WA Women's Hall of Fame in 2016 in celebration of International Women's Day. We're very, very privileged to have Mrs Green with us today. Thank you all. Um, I feel a bit nervous in front of all you very important people. Um, but um, yes, thank you for inviting me here today. Um, Kaya, Woodich Gatala, Yorgas, Marmon, Brittiamorts, um, Kulingas, if there's any, um, Yan Oriel Green, Yalamort, um, Yuud, Baladong, Woggle Gap. Um Niju Nunga uh Niju Wajak Buja Ano Wajak peoples. Nyan Jerupun Jinanang Nunuk Nija Nyan Jerupun Nunuk Nija Wajak Nunga Buja Wanju Nunga Buja Yanga Wangan Yan Kul Nija Ye Yan Jerupan Yanin Nunok Benang Benek Mudich Gedala Nunok. I just said hello, ladies and gentlemen, special guests. Uh, my name's Oriel Green. Um, my families are from the Ewood and Baladong and the Woggle Gap area. This is Wajak People's area, and I acknowledge the Wajak people. Uh, friends, I'm happy to welcome you to our Noongar country. Thank you for inviting me here and I hope to see you again some other time. I hope you have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, Oriel. International Women's Day is celebrated each year, as you know, on March the 8th, and today we join all genders around the world attending events just like this. And this event was actually profiled on the International Women's Day website. And it's to mark the economic, political and social achievements of women. Today's event is the ninth annual Edith Cowan Memorial Lecture, and it honours ECU's namesake, Edith Dirksy Cowan, the first woman elected to an Australian parliament. As you all know, she dedicated her life to equal rights, reducing barriers to education and providing inspirational leadership to women. So we're just following in that theme today. And now I'd like to introduce today's panel. 
for what will be an apolitical event, but one that recognises the challenges faced and overcome often by such front runners in the political arena and our Vice Chancellor. <laughs> <laughs> the Honorary Professor, Honourable Professor Carmen Lawrence, became Australia's first female Premier on the 12th of February 1990. She served as Premier until 1993 and became Western Australia's first female leader of the opposition in 1993 at that time when Labor was defeated in the state election. She served as leader until resigning in February 1994 to take up office as the member of the House of Reps for Fremantle. She was chosen to serve in the Keating Ministry and held the portfolios of Human Services and Health, as well as assisting the Prime Minister for Women's Interests until the government fell in March 1996. In 2004, she became the first woman president of the Australian Labor Party, following the first popular ballot of ALP members ever held to elect a national president. She often refers to political life as not a career or a lifetime occupation, but as a privilege of representation. Professor Lawrence has a Bachelor of Psychology, completed her PhD in 1983, and is a, currently a professor in the School of Psychology at UWA, with research interests in environmental behaviour, fire preparedness, and climate change. Please welcome Professor Lawrence. <laughs> The Honourable Dr Elizabeth Constable was the first female independent to be elected to the Western Australian Parliament following the Floriot by-election in July 1991. She was the only independent to become a minister in the Western Australian Parliament and the first woman to serve over 20 years. During her term of office, she was Minister for Education, Tourism and Women's Interests. Born in Sydney, she's been in WA now for 40 years. She was an undergraduate at Uni of Sydney, did a master's degree in clinical psychology, a diploma of education at UNE as an external student, and a master's degree in child development at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, and a PhD at UWA on the cognitive development of gifted children. In a former life, she was a university lecturer, and she's always been a strong advocate for gender equality. In her inaugural speech to the WA Parliament, she reflected on the 100-year history of the government in this state, noting that across both the Legislative Assembly and the Legislative Council, of those elected, only 23 out of 754 in that 100 years were women. So that's a staggering 3%. So needless to say, one of her hopes is for a more gender-balanced parliament in the not-too-distant future. Please welcome. Dr. Constable. <laughs> Dr. Anne Ali, MP, is Australia's first woman of Arab background and the first Egyptian born federal member of parliament. Before becoming the member for Cowan, Dr. Ali was a professor at Edith Cowan University. She was born in Egypt in a part of the world where the birth of a girl child is greeted not with adulation or congratulations, but with the clicking of tongues. But Dr. Ali is not defined by the circumstances of her birth. She is an ECU graduate for her Master of Education and PhD, and was the only Australian to be invited to President Obama's White House Conference on Violent Extremism in 2015. She has worked with the United Nations on developing programs and policies on national security and counter-terrorism. She's the founding chair of a not-for-profit organisation that harnesses entrepreneurship and innovation for young people. In her first speech to Parliament, Dr Ellie acknowledged her electorate was named after a woman, and not just a woman, but a groundbreaking one, the first woman to be a member of this Parliament. Please welcome Dr Ellie. And Professor Steve Chapman, <laughs> CBE, commenced his role as Vice Chancellor and President of ECU in April 2015. Prior to joining ECU, Professor Chapman was Principal and Vice Chancellor of Heriot Watt University from 2009 and Vice Principal at the University of Edinburgh from 2006. 
Mid-2016, Professor Tra Chapman travelled back to the UK and Buckingham Palace to be officially appointed Commander of the Order of the British Empire for his service to higher education. In October last year, he was announced as a National Workplace Gender Equality Agency Pay Equity Ambassador for Australia. Professor Chapman completed his undergraduate and PhD studies at the Newcastle University in the northeast of England and postdoc studies at MIT on a North Atlantic Treaty Organisation NATO Research Fellowship. And his first, he is the first male VC to be the only male in the WA team of VCs. And I'm pretty sure he is also the first Scottish chemist who is also a magician to be a WA <laughs> vice chancellor. <laughs> On a serious note, and I better say this, we're very privileged to have him as our CEO and president. And his commitment and action as a male champion for gender equality is both distinctive and marvellous. Please join me in welcoming Steve and our panel. And so now, the fun begins. Now I'm going to ask a series of questions of the panel members, but at any time they may like to chip in on others' answers, that kind of thing. So it's more of just a discussion rather than a t interrogation. <laughs> so Carmen, Edith Dirksy Cowan headed up voluntary organisations, mastered public speaking, served on boards, was an early woman justice of the peace, lobbied government and travelled overseas in the early 1900s, which was unusual for a woman, and in 1921 became the first woman member of an Australian parliament and was the second female member of any parliament in the British Empire. So you, can you talk a little bit about what you think political life would have been like for her? She's an extraordinary woman um, and obviously getting into parliament in the first place meant that she had a certain steely nerve, I think, which probably made it possible for her to deal with what would have been a pretty hostile environment. Mm. After all, our parliaments have been and still operate largely on the basis of a construction that is essentially male, the male politician as normal. And even though we've increased the number, um, that, that, that is still the case. So she would have confronted that in ways that we can barely imagine. Mm. And I'm sure that she stood out like a sore thumb. Um, which meant that she would have garnered a lot of attention. And this happens to women today, too, that because they are still, if you like, out of role, they are often observed um, more acutely and more critically, and I'm sure she would have been, too. The other thing that might have happened to her, and it's a bit hard to tell from reading about her, is that she was ignored, you know, put down, uh, diminished in, in many ways. So that, that could have happened. But she would certainly be have been seen as betraying her sex in a way, that she was doing something that was... Um, out of character mm. for a woman. And in fact, this obviously happened to her. I found a little reference to it in one of her speeches. And she says, it was explained to me that the Almighty never intended woman to be put in the position that I am in here today. I was obliged to remind that not only did the Bible tell us that it was not a good thing for a man to be alone. <laughs> That's a bit cheeky, you know, you need women in the parliament because they don't want to be alone. But male and female created he and gave them dominion over all things. I do not think he intended that special privileges should be granted to one section of the community which could not reasonably be granted to the other. So she was very clear about that, but she'd obviously taken that criticism about being, you know, in a in proper place. There was probably too more of a focus on her and her family, although she was nearly 60 when she went into Parliament, so her children were well and truly grown up. Mm -hmm. And that's a continuing problem for young women, that they have to deal with young children, but she didn't. And there would probably have been attention to her appearance, and certainly a stereotyping about her role. So again, for example, if you have a look at the time, the bulletin cartoons, there was a series of them done, that caricatured her as variously mopping the floor of the chamber, polishing the mace, taking her parliamentary seat behind a, um, a, a copper full of sudsy water and a washboard. So she was, even though she was out of her role, they were very clearly putting her right back in it mm. and she would have been very conscious of that. And she almost certainly encountered straight up and down prejudice, 
as indicated by that stereotype, stereotyping, and probably a bit of what we call benevolent sexism, that you need to be protected, that you're not capable of functioning without some male to assist you. And again, some of the interjections from men in the parliament suggest that that's the way she was viewed, the kind of little woman who needed up, up on the pedestal maybe to be protected from some of the nastier habits of the men. Um, so there would have been a lot of that around as well. But as I say, she was steely, she was tough. Um, she had a very clear idea about equality, so I'm sure she managed to hold her own slightly in build though she was. Mm. Mm. Thanks. Can Katie? I just add, there's, yeah. there's one exchange in, the, in Hansard where one of the blokes mm. says, why would she want to bring women down to the level of men mm. by being in parliament? Mm. And she said, no, 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 she wanted to bring men up to the level of women. <laughs> Which is one, one of my favourite quotes of hers. Mm. Yes. But I think she would have been very prepared for parliament mm. because she'd been so involved in so many things before mm. suffragette mm. movement, for instance, mm. and getting the women's vote. Um, fighting for women to be able to stand for parliament, which there was a, a, a bill passed in 1920. And so in 1921, she was elected. And the lovely thing about that was, I shouldn't say it like that, I don't suppose, but um, she won, won the seat uh, of West Perth, which had been held by the Attorney General, who had passed the bill to allow women to stand in Parliament. Yes. <laughs> so it's a nice irony. It, it's yeah. actually quite delicious when you think about it. Um, but but she, she had fought for so many things. She knew how to lobby to get things done, uh, things like um, King Edward Memorial Hospital. She was one of the people that pushed for that. There's uh, childcare, and isn't it interesting that today childcare workers are, are, mm. are walking, um, off. walking off the job this afternoon. Mm. And the thing that always grabs me about, about Edith, is that she fought for things that are still being fought for, for today, today yes. in a, perhaps in a different form, but they're still there and still incredibly important today. Mm. Mm. I mean, her, her agenda was quite radical too. I think we wouldn't yeah. recognise her political strike mm. today if you mm. tried to characterise her mm. agenda, as you say, mm. um, suffrage for women, improvement of the circumstances of women and children, uh, providing basic minimum wages, all these sorts of things. As might have come from the left of politics mm. today. Uh, she sat squarely, I think, yes, in the centre, it's fair to say, ultimately, mm. but mm. with an agenda that I think some of her nationalist colleagues probably weren't all that comfortable with. Mm. So she probably was fighting other battles mm. along the way with some of her colleagues, and it's obvious that they didn't always receive her representations very mm. well. Although mm. she did succeed, for instance, in stopping the transport minister, transport minister <laughs> from imposing uh, an extra charge for women with prams. And <laughs> That apparently was a very unpopular move, which they were willing to, to change their minds about. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it occurs to me, though, that it's great that we are remembering her in the yeah. sense that we can take out a $50 note mm. and we can see her face yeah. and we, yeah. can, we can read her name and we can hear her name mentioned in the university. Uh, and it, I, re I reflected on the fact that, that there are some women who've done great things that don't have that privilege. Yeah. And I'll, I don't know if anybody in this... Uh, audience knows of a woman called Vera Rubin. Anybody heard of Vera Rubin? And that's quite, quite astonishing to me because she's probably the greatest astrophysicist that ever lived. Mm -hmm. If she'd have been a man, you would know her and mm -hmm. she would have won the Nobel Prize. Mm -hmm. So she's the person who demonstrated the existence of dark matter, which holds the whole of the universe together. Recently died. There was a beautiful obituary of her. But, you know, she had four kids, would rush home to look after them in the evenings. She followed her husband to... Um, Cornell when she had a place in Harvard because she needed to be with him because he couldn't be alone, as we heard. <laughs> uh, uh, of course he uh, couldn't. And, and when she went to Pal 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 Palomar, the, the biggest telescope in the world, the first time, there were no female toilets in that because no one ever thought... And neither were there this, in the West Australian Parliament. Parliament that's but, right. But, until much, much later. But this yes. was 1965. Yes. 1965. Well, a I lot think you'll find it was, it was in the 70s here. In the 70s. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, there you go. It, yeah. but, so what she did was she cut out a black triangle and stuck it over the legs of the man <laughs> so it looked like it was a female, a female toilet. But that, I guess the, example, the, the reason I'm bringing it up is that I'm very proud that our true. university is named after Edith Cowan. And I'm also very pleased that she's still remembered and still acknowledged but I just wanted to make the point mm. that there are fabulous women out there the person I've just mentioned and probably maybe one person in the audience knew of her which is quite astonishing yeah. I mean, do you want to add anything go, sorry go, go ahead, go. I, I just think as well that it's important to acknowledge that some of the things that she fought for we're still mm. fighting for yeah. and it, it's yeah. still quite an anomaly to be um, I think 
more so to be probably a woman of colour in Parliament these days. I walk through the Great Hall and there are all these paintings of men and I feel like they're looking at me and going, what are you Ooh. doing here? <laughs> 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 That's how it feels like. And I remember like the first day in Parliament and people would say, who are you? As if I should be cleaning the toilets or something. So it's still, it, there, there are still, um, you know, transsectionalities of, of gender and other, other um, forms of, of um, discrimination that occur. And you, I still feel those things that um, in Parliament today. And it's almost like um, a very, there's still that undercurrent of stay in your lane, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Stay, stay where mm -hmm. you belong. Mm. Um, and you you still feel like you have to swim against that current still, and it's it's interesting um, what you were saying, Liz, about um, you know fighting for childcare and the fact that yes, today there are child uh, early childhood educators who are walking walking off the job for equal pay, um, and that today we still have a 27% gap here in Western Australia, uh, still still a 27% gender pay gap here in Australia. Um, and um, it strikes me that, you know, it's been decades, but we're still fighting for the same things. We may be fighting for them in different ways, we may be fighting for them at different levels, but we're still fighting for the same things. And um, in, in many ways, it's kind of disheartening as mm. well. Mm. I mean, uh, w one of the things that she fought for and succeeded in achieving was to allow women to enter the legal profession, for instance. Mm. And a little while ago, I was talking to a bunch of lawyers, so I, ha I actually had a look at their profession, and it was very clear that although, yes, they could practice and universities collectively train them, and there are more women trained in law than men are trained in law, mm. they are still, you know, not in senior levels, they're fewer partners, uh, there's a pay gap right from day one. And that's interesting mm. across a lot of... Uh, it, workplaces and professions, that it's not just that there are structural things that lead to those pay inequities like working more part-time jobs and working in female-only professions, but even when you're in a profession that is, you know, 50-50 or maybe, um, you know, slightly, uh, in this case, a preponderance of women at the beginning, you still end up with a lower wage. And so th there's a thinking mm. process going on there that maybe we can discuss later mm. yeah. um, that um, I, I think people like Edith Cowan wouldn't have anticipated. I, I think many of them hoped that when these structural changes came about that that was the end of the story. Trouble is we carry around mental models in our heads that lead us to make discriminatory judgments every day. Yes, yeah. and of course I wonder, you know, it's, it's sad that WA has the worst gender pay gap yeah. in the country, yeah. given um, who we're talking about. Yeah. I'm going to move on to the next question, Liz. Soon it will be 100 years since Edith Dirksy Cowan was elected to the Federal Parliament. It was the 12th of March 1921. She might have dreamed she'd open the floodgates for women into politics, but in Australia, women currently comprise around a third of all parliamentarians with variations between jurisdictions and chambers. So what would Edith say now? Uh, I wish I really knew, but I think that um, she'd be really disappointed um, because she did believe that once one woman was elected to parliament, then it would be easy for other other women to be elected. And between 1921, when she was elected, and 1983, there were eight women elected to the West Australian Parliament. So what was that, 60 years? Um, four in each house. And there were times like when June Craig was um, a member of the Legislative Assembly, she was the, uh, still the only woman in the Assembly. Um, and so she was in the same situation that, that Edith had been in. Mm -hmm. So I think Edith would be really, really disappointed to know that. Um, I think that um, when you consider Carmen was elected in 1986 and was the ninth woman in the Legislative Assembly and the 15th in the WA Parliament in 1986. And then when I was elected in 91, I was the 14th in the Legislative Assembly and the 23rd in the Parliament. And um, I think if I'd known that, I may not have even <laughs> stood for Parliament. Uh, so on, on election night in 1991, Mario Durazio, who was then the, the um, reporter for Channel 7, said, took me aside, he said, I want to tell you something. He said, you know, you're the first woman to be elected as an independent. And I thought, wow, I would not have done this if I had known that because <laughs> the, odds, the odds would have been so against me, it would have been um, just too hard. But today, only 88 women have been elected to the Western Australian Parliament, not yet 100, out of um, about, um, uh, well, a total of 965 people elected to the Parliament. And so if you take out the, 90, the 88 women, that's about one in every 10 elected over the, 
the, the life of the parliament um, that, are, that are women. And I'm, I'm, she'd, she'd be really disappointed, I'm sure. Um, and there's all sorts of reasons for that that we could go into, the pre-selection political parties, the way political parties are, are structured, um, things that we already know. Um, she'd also be disappointed, though, to know that of the ASX 200 companies, only 24% um, of the directors are women. She'd also be disappointed to know of those, those um, ASX 200 um, companies, only 10% of the CEOs are women. Um, I mean, sorry, it's 5%, 10 of them out of 200. Um, She'd be, more, she'd be pleased that more women than men were graduating from universities because she was, she was a, a, a one of the people pushing for a university to be established here in, in um, 1913. Um, she'd be appalled at the gender pay gap that's already been mentioned a couple of times. And she would be appalled to know that WA is so far behind the rest of Australia um, <clears throat> in gender pay gap. So there'd be lots of things that... Edith would be really disappointed with, but she'd be really pleased and proud of the women, I think, that had put themselves forward, not just the ones that had ended up in Parliament, but all those women that have stood for, for seats in Parliament and not succeeded and put themselves on the line to do that. They're incredibly brave people, often in seats that they know they're not going to win, but they get out there and have a go and try and push for the things that they believe in. And that, I think, she'd be incredibly proud of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and we shouldn't let universities off the hook either mm -hmm. because those patterns... No, I was going to those numbers, <laughs> And I'm sure it. you were. Um, <laughs> those patterns that uh, you see in politics and in business and in other areas of professional life, you see in universities. So there are fewer women at all most senior levels. We happen to be in an aberrant period now yes. with our vice-chancellors. 80% 80, 80 female. You're such a brave man. So that's, that's very unusual. We've had times when we had lots of premiers around the country too. Mm. It's, uh, it, you, can't, you can always point to exceptions in a way, but whether you're talking about the, the number of women at the senior levels, professionally, administratively, the pay, pay rates, um, the, the, uh, if you like, the fact that many of them are on contracts rather than mm. having uh, continuing positions, these are all characteristic of our universities as well and deserve, I think, greater attention. Uh, that Indeed. problem deserves greater attention than it gets. One of the problems that, that Edith Kahn faced, of course, with, with uh, being the only woman um, and being, in a sense, out of step with her party, and I think there's some evidence of that, is that even when we get more women into politics, if they're completely captive by their political parties, um, and Elizabeth knows this well, then you're not necessarily going to get a very different kind of representation. Mm -hmm. I know we're going to talk about that later. But numbers per se don't necessarily give you um, an indication of the quality of representation that you're getting. Having said that, I think a lot of women make the decision to go in politics precisely because they want to make a unique contribution. That's not, if you like, the white bread version of politics that many of their male colleagues apparently adhere to. So getting more women is in and of itself a matter of justice, but they need to bring with them an agenda which is clearly representative of the interests and mm. concerns of women and the wider community, um, I think not Steve, just you know, yeah. the brand. I think it's Steve to comment well, well, from I, a... Yep. Well, not from the vice chancellor, but, but listening to what, what, you, what you've both said, I wonder whether Edith Cowan at the time, yeah. had she had foresight to, to see what was going to come, would have said, if we go at the pace of allowing it to naturally evolve organically, it'll take us 150 years to get anywhere near parity or more. Uh, but the alternative is to be much more radical and say that we're going to have quotas. There are going to be strict, hard targets, and there are going to be quotas, and they're going to be legally enforced. Now, you get a lot of people who say, oh, and it, it, this is a meritocracy, we can't... But that's rubbish. Mm. They, we don't have a meritocracy. And it's the get-out-of-jail card for people who say, oh, well, of course there's not enough women, because it's a meritocracy. That's just rubbish. So I wonder whether or not Edith would have been an exponent of, let's be more radical, let's just mm. say we're going to have a quota, and by this time, we have to achieve it, and if not, there will be repercussions. For example, in organisations like universities, you could say the Vice-Chancellor's uh, remuneration will depend on whether or not he addresses the pay gap, whether or not he addresses you know, the, the um, poor progression of women, etc. You can link things to repercussions, and I think unless we do something more radical, we'll be sat around, well, we won't, but the equivalent <laughs> panel will be sat around here 70 years saying, you know, oh, yeah, Steve Chapman would have been very disappointed at the progress that happened. <laughs> so I, I, don't, I don't want that to happen in 70 years. I want something to happen now. 
Um, and Anne's probably well aware of this um, mm. as well. The Labor Party did adopt a system of quotas. Uh, in 1996, a bunch of us, and I was in the federal parliament at the time, had worked at state level and then at the federal level to say and win the argument that <clears throat> it would be 200 years before we got equity in the Labor yeah. Party in terms of male fe female representation. And we got the backing of Paul Keating at the time when we got that rule change through the party. It wasn't 50-50 to begin with, it was 35. That was a big improvement. Then it moved up to 40 and I think it's now, there's a target for 50 yeah, and you probably kept up with it better than I have. Yeah. And the result has been that if you look at the parliamentary figures, and this is not a partisan comment, most of the female representation comes from the Labor Party, yeah, the Greens, true. and to a lesser extent, the Independents. And the, the other major parties have not uh, adopted quotas, and as a result, they have a very small percentage mm -hmm. of women, and currently in the Cabinet. Mm -hmm. And I've got a specific question for you. Mm. Like many parliaments around the world, women uh, remain significantly underrepresented in the Australian Parliament. So we know from mm. the figures that um, have been talked about already, but as of December 2016, Australia ranked 50th out mm. of 93 countries in terms of the percentage of women in the lower house, House of Reps, and 28.7%. Um, and so why can some of the least developed countries, because I was looking at the ones that do have a gender balance, and they are effectively the least developed countries with vulnerable econ economies. Now they achieve over 50%. Yeah. So what's happening mm. that more developed countries who talk about gender equality struggle so much? That's such a good question, because I often say we, that we, we tend to, in the Western world, we tend to measure ourselves and our own progress by the status accorded to women. And we actually judge other societies by the status accorded to women. So we say, oh, their society is so backward or primitive because their women don't have and enjoy the rights of our women. And, uh, you know, throughout Australia's history from um, uh, back in the days um, in the 1800s, there was this narrative that an Australia that was vulnerable to uh, quote unquote Asian invasion uh, was an Australia where our women would fare worse off because our women were better off than their women. And if they came here and took over and there was this Asian invasion or, you know, now you, um, you have this talk of a Muslim invasion, that it would be detrimental to our women. So we've consistently compared and judged and assessed other cultures and other societies by the status accorded to women. And I think... You know, when you, and, and it's very true what you say there, Kobe, that there are some uh, developing countries that had way before Australia did, had the first female heads of state. Um, you've got countries um, in, uh, in the Middle East uh, and North Africa mm. that have 50% and more representation of women in their parliaments. Mm. Um, you know, you have uh, countries like Bangladesh and Pakistan had the first, had, had female heads of state way before we did. Mm. But we continue to judge those countries as lesser because mm. we believe that, um, that we're morally superior than them because of the status of our women compared to theirs. So even the terminology that they're less well developed, they might be less well developed economically, but they might be more developed, um, you know, socially, so to Absolutely. speak. Absolutely. That's and a language issue I too. think a big part mm. of it as well yep. is that we tend to... Um, we, we tend to kind of rest on our laurels a bit and assume that we've achieved so much in terms of gender, gender yeah. equity and equality. So I like, I like the fact that we have, you know, I, I had um, a journalist ring me and say, you know, what do you think of International Women's Day? Isn't it just tokenism? Why just one day a year? And what about the other 364 days of the year? And I said, well, we need that one day to be able to reflect on ourselves, to hold that mirror up to ourselves, and it's not something we do very well. Mm. We really don't do that very well. We're very good at holding up the mirror to other countries, to other societies, um, to, to other cultures, but we're not very good at holding it up to ourselves and examining you know, uh, the, 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 the inequalities that still exist and the reasons why we're still fighting for this. And you know, the thing is that next week another woman is gonna be murdered through in, fa in a family violence, domestic violence situation. Next year, we may still have this much of a pay gap 
gender pay gap. Two years from now, our early childhood educators may still be walking off the job um, and, and fighting for, for, for pay equality and recognition. So I think, you know, it's a good opportunity every International Women's Day and pretty much every day of the year to turn that mirror on ourselves and stop judging ourselves and taking that moral high ground mm. and considering ourselves better off than other societies because their women are worse off than our women and really look at ourselves first. Thanks, Anne. Uh, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd just like to... I don't want to um, push back on that because mm. I agree with a lot of what you said, but it, it, the fact that you may have a woman as a head of state does not m necessarily mean that women, a women's lot is going to be better. If you look yeah. at what Indira Gandhi did when she was ruling India, women's rights were not improved. In fact, many l legal things that happened to do with women's birth control, etc., were worse. Mm. So uh, I don't think we should just make the reaction that if you... We had Thatcher in Britain. A lot of the things she did affected the poorest in society and often the poorest in society are the carers. So having a woman as a head of state doesn't mean that you're, I think, any, any, doing any better yeah. in addressing your, the, the, the status of women in society. And there, there, there was, I think it was uh, Madeleine Albright who said, um, there's a special place reserved in hell for women who don't promote other women. And I think under Thatcher, there wasn't really promotion of women. Look at her cabinets. Mm -hmm. They were almost entirely male. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, I'm, I think it's a little bit more nuanced than, yeah. than what you might have indicated. Yeah. And, and I think it's obvious too, um, not only the examples you've given, but in the corporate sector some recent work has shown that where you have a female CEO, the pay gap is actually larger in that organisation mm. than it is really? in other places. In other words, there's maybe a sense, and some women certainly exhibit this, that I've made it, the rest of you can go to hell. Mm. And so unless, unless yeah. there's a clear agenda for women, um, to improve the status of women and the circumstances. And I've, I've often said this to women going to politics. As a matter of justice, it should be 50-50. Yeah. But don't think that that is in and of itself going to change the way we conduct business no, in this I, country I, I, or change the policies that are uh, adhered to. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree with that. And just in a flippant way, I'd like to say that there's an appalling um, gender pay gap in the vice chancellors in Western Australia, and I yeah. hope that's fixed. <laughs> <laughs> Just moving on. Um, I wouldn't go there because there's a whole question about the level of pay that senior executives Indeed. get. Indeed. So <laughs> we've talked about um, the number of women in parliament. Now we know it's risen slightly from 69 to 73. So what else can be done? We've talked about quotas, targets. What else can be done? That's to all of you. Can I just... I just think we need to... Um, yeah, politics isn't really an attractive career choice. <laughs> um, and, and once women are in parliament, it's much harder because the public life is harder for women. I mean, look at um, Gladys Berejiklian and when she became the Premier of, of New South Wales. And I remember listening to the radio and... Uh, and <laughs> A male journalist saying, well, you know, she might do a better job. I think she's going to do a better job because she doesn't have kids. She can focus more on the work, on the job. You know, so the, you, you, when, when you're a woman in public life and in political life, the, the level of scrutiny that, um, that you get is, 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 can be really quite, quite savage. Um, so I think, you know, politics needs to be able to attract more women and become more of an attractive vocation, I think, mm -hmm. um, you know, but that's coming from somebody who, who gave up a, a, a career in academia mm. to do this um, and is still very new in politics as well, so mm. perhaps... Keep, no, no, keep, yeah. that, keep that perspective. I think <laughs> it's very important. Once you become captured by the system, it's very hard mm. then to look back out again. Mm. So the, the view of an outsider is a very important one to sustain. Mm. You can't sustain it indefinitely, and indeed it's uncomfortable, but mm. it's important. And I remember when I first went into politics, I had the temerity to point the problems with the, the parliament out in Western Australia, and I got a fair bit of flack for that mm. too. But I said, amongst other things, that once you got into the parliament, and this is true for men and women alike, and I, like you, I came from academia, mm. that you were expected to kind of park your brain at the door. <laughs> uh, and that you, the idea that you would conform to a collective view, while it's an important element in democracy, was taken to an extreme, in my view. And, and not being able to express your own views, which I note that you're doing extremely well, <laughs> um, and having right. always to comply with um, what is 
sometimes even assumed to be the view of the leader or the majority, means that you don't get the best out of your uh, members of parliament. And I think that's one of the things that drives women away, mm -hmm. the idea that you have to abandon your identity both as a woman and as an independent thinker if you become involved mm -hmm. in politics. And I think we're not going to attract some women into politics until and unless the environment changes. And of course the problem is that if the environment suits the majority of people who are there, it's very hard to uh, effect those changes. It's, it's slow, it's glacial. Yeah. I think also women have so many great choices today. Mm. Why would you choose public life first? <laughs> <laughs> and I, but I also think, and this is my strong bias, the best parliament is one filled with people who've been successful at doing something yes. else mm. before they Absolutely. get there. Mm. And a, a few, I think the last parliament I was in, there wasn't one farmer. Mm. Not one farmer, when you think of agriculture as the second most important um, industry in, in Western Australia, you, mm. need a, you need a parliament that's, that's made up of successful people from every walk of life you can think of. And too many people think you've got to go in there and start it when you're really young. Not at all. I think it's best to, to choose something else, do well at it, and then think about what contribution you might make in public I life. Think, yeah, I yeah. think you've just answered the next question, which was, in Sorry. a way... No, no, that's good. <laughs> um, good, we're running out of time. Um, it was actually about, well, how would a gender balance improve decision-making in Parliament? So I guess that diversity of experiences... Really, I yeah. think... It, personally think that's yeah. really important. Yes. Yes. As, as uh, the point I made earlier, it, having 50-50 wouldn't necessarily improve mm. either the standard of debate or the outcomes. Yep. You really have to have people there who bring a range of experiences and points of view that are respected, um, not necessarily agreed with, but respected. So, uh, you know, I think it's, it's a fallacy for women to say, as they used to say to me, we just need a critical mass. And yeah. I'd say, well, no. no, you need a mass that is critical of the status quo. <laughs> yeah. So for me, one of the challenges is um, you've got biases that exist. In, and so, you know, you've got the sort of affinity bias where people tend to promote people who remind them of themselves. Clone themselves, yeah. So how do we change that to get that diversity? That's a challenge. Well, one would hope that when there are more women, mm. they'll do more of mm. that. So yep. at least yep. it's you know fighting back. But I think That's it requires right. a degree of kind of consciousness. Mm. Mm. I, well, yeah. to, to be honest, I think it, it requires a, an intervention of some kind of training. Mm. I was very sceptical years ago when I was a very arrogant person um, that <laughs> that, for example, things like unconscious bias even existed mm. until I did a course <laughs> and realised just how biased I actually was. Now, probably I'm just as biased, but at least I'm aware of it. Um, the, I think the problem is when you when you do try try and put training courses on for whatever reason, you tend to get the people who are already converted that come to the courses, and so they are already kind of aware that they need to take that into account. The really hard job is to get the people that are still in denial. So, uh, but I, I, you know, I, again, I, I would make it kind of, uh, kind of almost compulsory if you want to be on an interview panel. It, at ECU, in the future, you have to have done um, unconscious bias training. And if you haven't, you're not on the panel, as simple as that. And so we have to actually, I think, have some hard targets, but we have to back it up with training and support for the individuals. Because we can't blame them for years of gender reinforcement. We've all had that. That's right. The mental models we carry around. <coughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now, Liz, this is a personal question, and it's the last formal question. Um, so <laughs> others can chip in. But um, public life is hard, you've all alluded to that, and afterwards it's equally as hard for a range of reasons. Um, for instance, in office you develop a unique skill set, accumulate a wealth of knowledge. So what can we do to see those valuable lessons you've learned as women political leaders put to better use once you actually decide to go into other Yes, I think journeys. that um, somehow we've got to improve the, the general sense that people have of, of politicians. We tend to be mm. thought of as not all that special. And not that we're special, but that we haven't really got much to offer. Mm. Whereas I think if you look at the United States to some degree still, there's a notion that you can move in and out of public life out of, out of business into public life, back into business or academia or some other position. Whereas here, I don't think that that's, that's um, so. It can be for some people, but not for others. And I was particularly taken after the 2013 election when I retired 
that there was two or three people that kept in contact with me, in fact they were obviously party people, who, who kept asking me to be a referee and for one of them it went on for over a year. Talented person could not get a job. Mm. And um, people I don't think recognise the incredible opportunity you have as a Member of Parliament to understand a community and learn things and see things and do things not many other people get the opportunity to do. Um, so I don't think I don't think a retired um, politician, a member of parliament, or um, someone that's lost their seat, which can be devastating, especially to younger people. Look at when they have to suddenly go out and look for a job, having been um, a member of parliament. Um, I think that that the community doesn't quite see us um, in in the light that perhaps they should. Mm -hmm. Any, it's just a, a, a just from personal experience yeah. of, of having to guide people and help them after they've they've lost their seats or, yeah. mm. or retired and not have anywhere to go. Mm. But I think that comes back to what you were saying, Carmen, about you know attracting people who have done other things yeah. before. The, like so, I have one of the most marginal seats in Australia and the most marginal seat in Western Australia. It's 0 0.68 or something like that. Um, and I know that, um, you know, I may have three years in Parliament. Uh, I, may be I may be voted out in the next election. I may have six years, I may have nine years, but that gives me a sense of urgency of something to achieve. But it's also consciously on my mind that this isn't a gig that is a permanent gig for me. I don't have a 20% margin like some people do in Parliament. Um, and I'm very aware that this may be something that I only do for six years, nine years, three years, and then go back to doing what I was doing before. Hopefully, Steve will have me back. <laughs> <laughs> Come and see me. <laughs> so I think it goes back yeah. to that. And I think that's a very good attitude to have. Um, as Liz has pointed out, though, having been in politics, you may find that there's a, a certain taint that goes with it, not a, another bloody mm. politician. I have to say, um, I haven't had any problems myself, but I know others oh, who I have. Know. It, and and it is, it's quite difficult for them to resume the career or find mm. another piece of employment, not because they're you know, precious about it, but because they really literally can't. I mean, uh, I've, people have ended up, you know, after years and years of trying in, in quite senior positions using those skills. But in other cases, you know, it's, it can be an unhappy outcome. But I think you're right. If they kept in mind right from the outset, this is not my right, this is a privilege, mm. and at some point I'll have to resume my career. Mm. One of my colleagues at UWA dug out of his bottom drawer somewhere um, a daily news banner which was obviously applied at a quite different times saying, Lawrence resumes her career, and he <laughs> handed it to me saying, and now you're back. <laughs> okay. 21 years in politics, didn't cut it. <laughs> Thanks to the panel for asking that set of questions. Now we've got time for questions from you. If you could just um, put your hand up, a roving mic will magically appear, and just say your name and, you know, what you do, or something like that, a bit of context. Hi, my name's Robin. Thank you very much. That was really interesting. The West Australian reported this morning that one of the local primary high schools in my area, Woodvale Senior Secondary College, co-ed school, has just appointed two head boys because they couldn't find a girl who was up to the job. So, and I've got teenage girls. How do you, what do you say to the girls and how do you keep them motivated and tell them, well, yes, you are good enough. You're as good as the boys. I think even more surprising was that the school claimed that no one had complained about it or brought it to their attention. But, and if that's, that's true, then that's a problem as well. Don't we have boards of governors' schools? I mean, why wouldn't the board of... If I was on the board of that school, the principal would be reprimanded severely. Well, it, it doesn't really matter whether the principal is female or male. The action is appalling because of the message it sends out. And the board of governors have a duty to, to, to react to that. Yeah. I think it's just not, not good enough. And I think the standard that we walk past is the standard that we accept. When, mm. I, when mm. I got elected, I did not set out to be the first anything. No. Never no. set out to be the first anything. I just um, did what I had to do, won the election, and then suddenly it dawned on me that I was the first Arab woman, I was the first Muslim woman, I was the first Egyptian-born woman. And I didn't understand the significance of it until I started getting phone calls from women saying to me, 
thank you so much because I keep telling my daughter that she can do anything that she wants, but you've made it real. You've made it real. So I think it's not good enough to say that that you know that 50% of our population we can't tap into that 50% of that population and find um, you know the, the the skills and the talent that's necessary. Um, and that's really disappointing. Mm. That school is really disappointing. Yeah. You thinking of taking your girl out of there? <laughs> <laughs> It's terrible. Oh, it's terrible. I, I mean, I have to confess I stopped reading the West Australian the day I left politics. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, I, so I didn't pick up that story. And, and although I agree with what's been said, I think there's another question that should be asked. Why did no girl put her hand up? What, 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 were, the, what were the pressures... I mean, I look at some young women and I see them under enormous pressure to conform to some fairly narrow stereotypes of what women and mm -hmm. girls can do. And we know that um, there was that um, publicity about some research recently that showed that five-year-olds, uh, boys and girls, both thought that they were fantastic and they could do anything. By the age of six, girls were already deferring to the boys as yes. being cl yep. cleverer in the class. Yep. So I would say to that school and to the, envi uh, to the education system generally, what is it that we're doing to young girls that either they didn't feel they could put their hands up or they were, you know, in some ways terrified of doing so because of the social odium that would go with it. Second, another question that comes from that is, maybe the girls are being smart. Perhaps power migrated elsewhere a long time ago and there's nothing to be said for being a head girl. I don't know. Do, do, don't you think, though, that common? I mean, I don't... I think it sends a message about what the culture of that school must be like. Oh, the, the school should fix uh, and it. So it, it's far, the, the ramifications are far more than the fact that they haven't chosen a female yeah, yeah. Uh, f f as a as yeah. school head. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Any other questions? Yep. Andy? Thank you. Yes, mm -hmm. very. Thank you very much for that very inspiring. Uh, Caroline Barrett-Pugh from ECU. Uh, I'm wondering what are one or some of the most powerful strategies or methods that you have used to bring about change for women? Thank you. Yeah. Where do we start? <laughs> Look, I'm often asked those kinds of questions and I'm stumped every time. Because I think each of us does what we can do. Um, if, you, if you're articulate and you get across your message well and you're a persuasive communicator, do that. If you're good at organising and getting things done and ensuring that events occur um, as, as predicted to uh, undertake certain um, capacity building, if you like, then do that. I don't think there's a single recipe in any of this, but to be conscious all the time of the need for improvement and to be aware of the barriers as well as the possibilities. So I, I don't, as I say, I don't think that I've... I can point to lots of events and lots of occasions and lots of people, but I'm not sure they add up to a row of beans. It's often more about the energy and commit, commitment you give to any encounter you ever have with anybody, yep. pushing back against sexism when you encounter it, yep. refusing to take part in events if they're not properly organised to represent the views of women and so on. Yeah. I got it. Um, last year I got... Or was it last year? Last year I got an award from a magazine they rang me, they said, you're our woman of the year. And I went, oh, wow, that's nice. Why am I that? And they said, um, because you're a disruptor. Would you like to tell us why you're a disruptor? And I went, me? <laughs> <laughs> Disrupt? <laughs> I'm not a disruptor. I'm a but then when I started thinking about it, sometimes just being the person who makes people look twice mm -hmm. can be very, very powerful. You know, when you're walking past those paintings of the men in, you know, the Great Hall in, in Parliament and you see a woman um, and particularly a woman of colour, a minority woman, an Aboriginal woman like Linda Burney and you go, what? And you have to take a double take and that makes you question the stereotypes that you've held in your head. That can sometimes be a starting point, a platform, a springboard for all of those other other things and all of the other conversations that need to be had. So sometimes it's hard to accept, um, you know, just having a place at the table, but sometimes having that place at the table can be the most powerful thing that you can do. Uh, I, from, for, for, from my perspective, I think two things I think about. One, 
you've, as, the, as the chief executive, as the leader, you've got to kind of set a tone. And I think I can do that. And if people get the tone that certain things are not acceptable and certain things are, that's fine. But if you try to set that tone, then you have to call out everything that doesn't fit with the tone. So the other day I was at an event, doesn't matter what the event was, and there was a very powerful lawyer there talking in favor of women's rights. But, but he had a, and he had a, a, a picture of a, of, a, of a female lawyer who'd called out some things, and he said, you know, yeah, she's my pinup girl. Oh. Now, now, you know, that was just <laughs> so clearly unconscious bias. And no one in the audience said anything, but my hackles rose on the back of my neck, and I waited till it happened afterwards. It was about harassment and things. I said, you know, language is important in sexual harassment, isn't it? And he said, yeah, yeah. He was completely unaware of what was coming. <laughs> Yeah. And I said, um, so for example, if, if in my, my team that I had around me, I said, oh, you're, you're really good on my team, you're my pinup girl, what do you think the effect would be on that woman? And I said, and what if you think I kept saying that? Well, that would be harassment, wouldn't it? And he just literally swall got swallowed up by the floor. But basically he said, I'm incredibly sorry, I had no idea. And afterwards he came up and he was so apologetic. My point wasn't that I wanted to destroy the guy, at all. My point was that, one, she, she, pin-up is a sexualized language. And secondly, she's not a girl. Would you have said a pin-up man? Really? I mean, so you, you, literally, you literally have to be relentless in calling that out, even if afterwards you feel, oh, I feel so sorry for the guy. And, and, but the other thing, the reason that I thought I had to call that out was, he was a lawyer working in that space, advising universities in Australia. If he's getting the language wrong, so I, I didn't blame the guy, but it demonstrates how deep mm. unconscious bias goes. It's years and years of conditioning, and you have to call it out every time you see it, even if it's mild. And the what we permit, you know, we condone, and what we condone, we encourage. Absolutely. Absolutely. Any other questions? Yes? There's two in the middle, and I can't, yeah. So that might wrap us up then. So last two. Um, my name's Hilary. What I think is interesting at the time of Edith Cowan's very short um, interest in getting into Parliament, it was only days or weeks, but um, when she campaigned and then was elected, probably the, um, the women of the day were just so anti her before, during and after her election. And I think that's worth remembering. Mm. And the other issue is um, when women stand for positions, there's the argument, do I vote for that person because they're the best person or do I vote for them because they're the woman and the best person? So there's the, you know, I just wonder what the panel think about that. We only have to look at the US, yeah. it didn't really happen. <laughs> I'm not sure that people actually think I'm going to vote for a woman. No. I'm not sure, I think that they, they think I'm going to vote for who the person I think is going to best represent everyone. Mm. Um, yes. It's my experience, mm. but I, mm. I don't... I think it works, it works the other way mostly, um, that if there are people in the community still who aren't positively disposed toward voting for women, there may be some who are positively disposed toward voting for them, but they don't show up in any of the polls that I've seen. No. Um, by and large, it is about the best person for the position, Judging that, by the way, is the devil's own task yeah. because it's very difficult to get to know your local representative, even if they've represented you for some time, let alone if they're just putting their names forward for the first time. So a lot of it is about those ephemeral impressions that are created. And uh, sometimes women will find that goes in their favour. They look approachable, they look friendly, for example. Sometimes they won't if they, if they don't look those things, if they look a bit tough, for example. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, 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 the false impressions can act against women as they can against men. But I didn't find in my public life that people voted for me just because I was a woman, although no. I think some of my colleagues hoped that that might be the case and that we could, against all the odds, win the election in 1993, <laughs> <laughs> having cleaned up the stable. <laughs> I think as well it's important to recognise that that the, um, I guess the skills and the diversity that women bring to a role. And um, I know that when, um, when I got elected, so many women came up to me and said, I voted for you because you were a single mum. And I was a single mum. And um, so many said, you know, I voted for you because your story is like my story. 
And I think that sometimes That's we it, neglect that. We neglect that, that women bring a, a set of life experiences that are different to what, what men bring. Um, and that sometimes for, for the women who are voting for our electorate, having somebody who they can look at and say, that's me, or they can mm. look at and say, I'm reflected in that person's life experiences too. I feel some connection with that person. I think that makes a it difference. Does matter. Yeah, mm. It does Last matter. Last question. My name's Taryn Hansen, and I've just um, started studying at ECU, so I thought it was quite interesting to come back here <laughs> and listen to this. I'm a mother of three girls. This is really a hot topic for me to like women's rights and, and how things are changing. But I've actually just returned from eight years overseas, and I've lived in Scandinavia and, and the Middle East. So I've seen, I think, both extremes. Mm -hmm. And I feel like in, in Scandinavia, they've got so many things right that how do we get Australia to be more like that? Things like, because I, I had, had young children in Scandinavia and took access of the great early education and childcare for, for next to nothing, because obviously the government's put so much emphasis on that. It's important women can continue working, you can have a career, you can have children and it doesn't actually affect your sort of your bank balance because here so many of my friends have had to step out of the workforce because <coughs> childcare is just too expensive um, there's not part-time work available and you know they that I think that's the biggest reason why you're not seeing women in parliament and women in high careers in Australia is because you have to take time out of out of your careers to have children because you can't afford to keep working Whereas how, how can we be more like the Scandinavian countries and, and, and value childcare and value women going back to work part time and, and having those opportunities? I think that would help, but how can we help that happen? One, uh, one of, rather than just let the science, I, I'm terrible, I can't bear the science. <laughs> Sorry about that to my fellow panellists. But I'm sure we've all looked at the Scandinavian example in a whole range of areas, including in childcare and, and um, a whole range of uh, policies that make it easier for men and women both to participate in the workforce and in civic society, even when they have small children. We don't do a very good job of that in Australia, it's, it's fair to say, compared with other equally wealthy nations. There are a range of reasons for that, and it, this is going to sound a bit political. One of them is courtesy of Maggie Thatcher's legacy, and that is the kind of atomisation uh, of our societies, the, the failure to r act collectively the Scandinavians really do have a sense of we're all in this together and they're willing to pay higher taxes and to tax corporations at higher level, mm -hmm. levels in order that they can collectively provide for the care of their children and better education standards and well-paid maternity leave and so on. So that's, I think, the dilemma for us. We've gone the opposite direction. You've got more money, in a sense, in your pocket for certain periods of time, but you're less able to purchase the things that actually make it possible. Mm -hmm. So it's can a paradox. I can I just say that yeah. there's a very small group of women who I think are amazing, and that's the women who are in Parliament and have babies. Yeah. Oh, yeah. While I was uh, in Parliament, I think three or four women had babies. One had twins. Um, but when I looked at it, they had very supportive families mm. or uh, partners who, in fact, were involved in the childcare and mainly did not work. Mm. But it's it always amazed me. I could never have done that myself to see women that... that, that that did that. I, I just want to say we need cultural and substantive change and the first thing yeah. that we can do is value our early child care and early childhood workers. Um, that to me is the first thing that we can do. They don't just wipe snotty noses and change nappies. They are actually educators um, and you know if, if that's, the, that's the starting point is getting fair pay for them and recognising the valuable work that they do. Um, and the value of, of, um, of childcare and how important it is. But very briefly, I think, I think if Australia can look out and it can see role models around the world. It can go down the society that's very individualistic, like the US, where they're cutting back on Obamacare, which brought 20 million people into, the, into health insurance, and now that's going to be rail back. Or they can look towards the Scandinavian model, which is a much more social model. But it's a choice. If you want the social model, you have to pay for it. You can't have the American model of taxation and the social model of Scandinavia. You have to do both. And I'm not sure that Australia's really come to grips with that because it doesn't want to pay the taxes, but it wants all the benefits. You know, there are other possibilities. I have a son who lives in America, married to an American, beautiful American person, and um, they have two children. And while she was a fairly senior executive in a, in a drug company in California, that company 
on their campus provided daycare for 400 children mm. in, in groups of 12 from birth so that mothers who had gone back to work could go and breastfeed their children during the day. It's the best early childhood care I have ever seen in my life and early childhood education. So it, it can be done by private industry as well. Mm. And um, it was just brilliant. So I think there's all sorts of ways to look at it and it was subsidised. It can be done in private industry, but if you look at childcare in the US, it's probably the worst in the Western yes, world. Yes, but this was, this was an American... I know, yeah. I know all that. Little pockets but of, but yeah. pockets of, of, of excellence yeah. that, that give another example in of what can companies. be done. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, you know... Thank you. Why not? They're doing not? what they should be doing. I, I, I think they should be doing it, but I think Thank everyone you. else in society should have, <laughs> have access, as well. access as well. Okay. I don't disagree with that. Thank you. saying there are other examples. Thank you, Vice-Chancellor. Thank you.